This is going to be the overview for the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew has 1071 verses, 23,343 words, and 28 chapters. And it's written to present Jesus Christ as King of the Jews. That's important. All of the Gospels are written to show you a different aspect of Jesus Christ. It's written to present Jesus Christ as King of the Jews. The theme is a king and his kingdom. And men bow down to Jesus Christ at least ten times in the book of Matthew because he's king. And because he's God manifested in the flesh. This book is about a political kingdom of heaven. So the Lord gets a civil servant to write it, which is Matthew. The author is Matthew, also known as Levi the Publican. And Matthew means gift of Jehovah. And we know that every book of the Bible, every verse of the Bible has historical, doctrinal, and devotional applications to it. The historical application is the earthly life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. He came into his own and they received him not. And this book explains the Jews' rejection of their king. Doctrinal, the doctrinal application, Jesus offers the kingdom to Israel and they reject it. But it will it'll be reinstated when Jesus comes back. Now, the devotional application, men rejected Jesus Christ even though they had Old Testament scriptures that would reveal he was the king and men fell to trust the words. Men are always failing to trust the words. And men rejected Jesus Christ even though they had Old Testament scriptures that would, re would have revealed that he was the king. Now, here's a brief outline of the entire book of Matthew. Chapters 1 through 2, you have the genealogy and birth of the king. Chapter 3, John the Baptist announces the king. Chapter 4, you have the proving of the king, because the devil tempts the Lord Jesus Christ there in chapter 4. And 5 through 7, you have the proclamation of the king, which is the constitution of the kingdom. In chapters 8 through 9, you have the credentials of the king. You'll see signs and wonders. In chapter 10, the 12 are sent forth and they preach the gospel of the kingdom. In 11 through 12, you have the rejection of the king and his kingdom. In 13 through 25, the kingdom parables of the king. The, this kingdom is in parable form because of the Jews' unbelief. So you have the kingdom parables. In 26 through 27, you have the arrest, trial, and crucifixion of the king. And they even nail it above his head, as you know. In 28, you have the resurrection of the king. So in chapter 1, let's really break it down now and look at each chapter. In chapter 1, you have the genealogy of Jesus Christ. This is the genealogy of the king. This shows you the line of Jesus Christ when it comes to his humanity. He was born of a virgin. When it comes to his deity, the fact that he was God manifested in the flesh, he has always existed. In Matthew 1, 1, it says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The fact that he is the son of David means he is from the tribe of Judah. He is therefore the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is in the line of the king and notice that when the genealogy gets down to Joseph, which is the husband of Mary, that it doesn't call him Jesus, it doesn't call Joseph Jesus Christ's father. It simply calls him the husband of Mary, protecting the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Notice it says in Matthew 1.16, And Jacob beget Joseph, the husband of Mary of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So Mary is that virgin who would be with child, prophesied by Isaiah. However, Mary did not stay a virgin after Jesus Christ was born, as the Catholic teach. If she did, then she defrauded Joseph, and he would have had to stay a virgin himself. And that would have been uh, rough 
on Joseph. So the teaching that Mary is, is still a virgin even after she has Jesus, that's definitely wrong. Now, she was a virgin when she had Jesus, but after that, Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ had brothers and sisters. And 1 Corinthians 7, 5 says, Defraud ye not the other, except it be with content, consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Uh, Mary would have been defrauding Joseph, which didn't happen. Now we see the birth of the king in Matthew 1, 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So this is the birth of the king. And in Matthew 1, 20 through 21, it says, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which was conceived in her, which is conceived in her, is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth the son of and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And then in verse 22 it says, And all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and notice this, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So Joseph did not lay with Mary until they, she brought forth her firstborn son. And they called him Jesus, just like the angel told him to. The angel assures Joseph that Mary hasn't been with another man, but is actually with child of the Holy Ghost, fulfilling Scripture. Joseph, being an honorable man, follows through with what the angel tells him to do. Then in chapter 2, we have the, the birth of the king and the visit of the, of the wise men. The wise men knew from Daniel 9.25 that their king was about to show up on the scene. And they see his star. In Matthew 2 and verse 2, it says, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Remember that stars in the Bible are also angels. In Revelation 1.20, it shows us that. So that star which they saw, it's most likely an angel. And when King Herod hears of the birth of King Jesus, he's troubled. And this is because he is full of the devil. Watch out for people who get troubled about Jesus Christ showing up. Herod was troubled. And in, in verse 8 it says, And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Now notice he is, the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ would now be a young child. He's not, it, some time has passed, he's not a baby anymore. But notice he, that Herod is a religious fake. He claims he wants to worship the king. But secretly, he wants to kill the king. Just like the Pharisees who look good on the outside, but are inwardly wicked. And Joseph gets warmed in a dream to flee to Egypt with Jesus and Mary. And Herod is about to cause mandatory killing of children, two and under. That's because, you know, Jesus is not a baby anymore by this point. Some time has passed. But watch out for men who are okay with killing babies. And it goes beyond fleshy sin to want to shed the blood of the innocent. But notice that the first time Jesus came, they were killing children and babies. The second time he comes, they're going to be killing children and babies. By the end of chapter 2, Jesus, Joseph, and Mary end up in Nazareth. And in chapter, C, chapter 3, you see what the ministry of John the Baptist is like. He is preaching out in the wilderness of Judea. And he fulfills the scriptures. 
In Matthew 3, 3, it says, For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. He is a negative preacher. He yells that they need to repent. And if he was here today, your pastor probably wouldn't let him preach. He wore camel's hair and a leather, leather, leather girdle. His breath smelled like locusts and wild honey. If he was in Egypt during the plagues, it would have been like a locust buffet for him. If he came back in Revelation chapter 9 and seen the locusts come out of the bottomless pit, he would just think the Lord supersized his combo meal. I mean, he was a rough character. He came to prepare the way of the Lord. And we also need to prepare the way of the Lord. Everywhere you go, make it easier for God to work in someone's heart and easier for the next Christian to preach the gospel to them. Prepare the way. But John says in Matthew 3, 11 through 12, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. John the Baptist here, a roughneck wilderness preacher, he even knew there were differences in baptisms. Here he mentions three of them, in, in these two verses. John's baptism was to manifest Jesus Christ to Israel, according to John one thirty one, And he mentions that Jesus Christ will baptize them with the Holy Ghost. That refers to the spirit baptism, and that has nothing to do with water. In 1 Corinthians 12.13, it shows you this spirit baptism. This happens the moment you believe the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. This baptism has absolutely nothing to do with water. It's the Spirit baptism that took place the moment of salvation. You didn't even know what happened when it happened. And then John says that Jesus will baptize them with fire. And then verse 12 shows you that this is a baptism into the lake of fire. Because it says, Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wood into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That has to do with those that are cast into the lake of fire. It's a baptism of fire. So Jesus Christ gets baptized by John the Baptist, and he does this to fulfill all righteousness. He participates in John's baptism, which is a, even John's baptism is a little bit different than ours today. It's a little bit different than believer's baptism because John's baptism was to manifest Jesus to Israel. It was the same in that he was fully immersing people. But it was for a different purpose. In Matthew 3.15 it says, And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. You see, Jesus Christ did everything a man would have to do to be perfectly righteous. And it says in verse 16 and 17, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now there you have the Godhead in these two verses. The Son is getting baptized. The Father is speaking from heaven. And the Spirit is descending like a dove. There you have all three persons of the Godhead. One God manifested in three persons, one in three and three in one. Chapter 4 is the great chapter showing the temptation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ goes up into the wilderness and fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. The devil comes to him. He wants to go after him while he's hungry, when his flesh would be at its weakest. This way, it would just be easier. 
to, to tempt the Lord and go after his flesh. And everything the devil tempted him with, Jesus used a scripture to counter it. If, if this was a boxing match, it would be worse than Logan Paul voice versus Floyd Mayweather. You have an amateur versus a pro. You have the creator versus the creature. And the devil gets knocked out like Nate Robinson. And in chapter 4, you will see where Jesus Christ begins to call his disciples, uh, preaches and teaches in the synagogues, and heals all manner of sick people. Every problem they had, they brought it to Jesus Christ. Just like every problem we have, we should bring it to Jesus Christ. And 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Every problem you have, you need to bring it to Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what it is. You say, well... This problem is so just so vain and meaningless. Pretty much every part of your life is vain and meaningless. So you might as well bring that to Jesus too. In chapters 5 through 7, it will show us the constitution of the kingdom. These will be the rules for the future millennial time period. The average modern pastor will try to apply all these things in these chapters to himself today in the doctrinally. And in these chapters, you have what is called the Sermon on the Mount. And of course, we can get practical things out of it for ourselves. In Matthew five eleven through 12, it says, Blessed are ye, when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. If you're serving God and people make fun of you and spit on you and hit you or try to restrain you, then don't worry because great is your reward. You'll rack up at the judgment seat of Christ for that stuff. So he says in verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You don't want to parade your good works like the Pharisees but openly, good works are a testimony to the lost world. So let your light shine before men. Let them see your good works. But notice it said, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You don't want people to glory after you. You want God to get the glory by your good works. That's the difference. If you're doing it with the wrong motive, you're going to cause people to easily glorify in you. But you want them to glorify the Father which is in heaven. Matthew five eighteen it says, For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So this book won't fail. It will be fulfilled. And you'll see that Jesus Christ preached on a lot of different topics in the same sermon. Proof, you don't have to stay on topic all the time. You can get off topic. You can run around and talk about all types of different things. In Matthew five twenty nine through 30, it says, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. So, Jesus Christ is a hellfire preacher. He gives some of the roughest talk about hell throughout the Bible. He goes on to talk about divorce and oaths and retaliation and loving your enemies. He's got all types of things that he wants to preach about, so he's, he's skipping around some, talking about different topics. And in chapter 6, he talks about not doing things for show, whether it be giving, whether it be praying or fasting, are you doing those things for show or are you doing those things out of a sincere heart? In Matthew 6, 1 and 2 and 3 and 4, it says, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Notice, if you're doing it to be seen of men, God is not happy with it. Therefore, when thou doest alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. 
Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. That thy alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. You see these filthy rich celebrities giving money, and they always have to sound a trumpet about it. It's a big ordeal. I seen Tyler Perry speaking at T.D. Jake's church or something, and he said he was led to give a million dollars or something like that to so-and-so. And the crowd goes wild. Well, there is his reward. He blew it. He got up there in front of thousands of people and let everybody know how giving he is. He let his left hand know what his right hand doeth. He made everybody think he's so spiritual. He should have just done it in secret. And then he puts his hand on T.D. Jakes and Jakes starts flopping around. And then this woman gets on stage exhorting the people, saying to push that baby out. Just It was just a mess. This is nothing but a fake money-making machine. And it makes God sick. It makes me sick. It ought to make you sick. They wouldn't know the Bible if it smacked them across their lying teeth with it. All they're doing is trying to get people's money. Jesus goes on to talk about people who pray for a show. And a big part of what you see today in churches is nothing but a big show. Some people can be so churchy. I never could be churchy even when I wanted to. I'm just lousy me. I'm the same everywhere that I go. I don't become some type of spiritual hero when I enter a church building. But some people do. Some people, they, they go to church on Sunday, and they're churchy. They put on a big show. They go to work Monday, and they cuss up a storm, and they're mean to people and a smart aleck. You need to be the same everywhere you go. Don't be somebody different at work through the week than you are at church. On Sunday but the Lord goes on to talk about fasting and if you're going to fast and don't let everybody you come in contact with know about it in Matthew 6 19 he talks about laying up treasures in heaven and if you're doing all your good works to look good in the eyes of man then these works are just going to get burned up at the judgment seat of Christ he's going to try every man's work of what sort it is and in chapter 7, the Lord starts off by preaching about judging others. And what the average person doesn't realize is this is referring to hypocritical judgment. It's not saying that you can't judge anything or anybody. It's referring to hypocritical judgment. In Matthew 7, 1 through 5, it says, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So you can't be going around telling people to quit a certain sin when you have a, when you have a huge beam in your own eye. First, quit the sin that you're doing, that horrible pet sin that you got in your life, and then you'll be able to see clearly to help your brother get a sin out of his life. You see, it's about hypocritical judgment and not against judging entirely. The verses aren't saying you can't judge at all. And actually, the Bible teaches that you should judge. In 1 Corinthians 12, or 1 Corinthians 2.15, it says, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. And John seven twenty four it says, Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So there's a righteous judgment, and then there's the wrong kind of judgment, the hypocritical judgment in Matthew 7, 1 through 5. But you're going to have to judge some things sometimes. Just because someone has done a horrible sin in the past, doesn't mean they can't judge something as being a sin today. Just because you committed a sexual sin in the past doesn't mean you can't come out and say adultery is a sin. And once you get the beam out of your eye, it's not hypocritical anymore. 
for someone to say that you can't judge something because you already did it in the past, then that would mean that nobody could say anything is wrong because we've all done something wrong in the past. But now in Matthew 7, 12, Jesus gives you what they call the golden rule. There it says in Matthew 7, 12, Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. If people live by that one verse, do you realize how good the workplace would be? Do you realize how good your marriage would be? If you treat people like you wanted to be treated, it'd be heaven on earth. Jesus goes on to talk about how you can know a false prophet by his fruits. And Hebrews 13, 15 talks about the fruit of your lips. You can know a false prophet by the words that come out of his mouth. You can judge him by, by that a lot quicker than watching his lifestyle. Because they can put on a good show with their lifestyle. Jesus preaches about these false prophets in verses 21 through 23. And he will say to them, I never knew you when they get up there at that great white throne judgment. Some men use that to teach that a Christian can lose their salvation because these men did many wonderful works. But realize what the Lord said there. He said, I never knew you. If they had been a saint at one point, then the Lord would have known them at one point. But he said, I never knew you. Pay attention to the words. Now, want me to prove it that they would have been known of God if they had been a saint at one point. In Galatians 4, 9, it says, But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God. So when you get saved, you become known of God. If these are people that lost their salvation, he wouldn't have said, I never knew you. But in chapter 8, Jesus cleanses a leper. He heals Peter's mother-in-law. He heals the centurion's servant. In Matthew 8, 2 and 3, it says, And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. So just like when you got saved, you believed on Jesus Christ. You called on him. And immediately you were clean. Just like, and immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And in this same chapter, Jesus also heals the centurion's servant in verses 5 through 10. The centurion was a man of authority, but still realized he was a servant to a master in heaven. And in verses 14 and 15, Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. And the fact that Peter was married and has a mother-in-law proves he was not a pope. You know, they try to say he was the first pope, but popes don't get married. And the Catholic Church forbids certain men to marry, which is a doctrine of a devil, according to the Apostle Paul. And in verse 16, he casts out unclean spirits with his word. If you think you're full of the devil, then get some of that word in you. Hide it in your heart. Constantly be putting more and more of the word of God in your heart. And you're gonna, he's going to cast out the devils from you with his word as you're reading it. Matthew eight sixteen, When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word, and he healed all that were sick. He didn't use a wooden cross or prayer beads or holy water or, a, or anything like that. He used his word. In Matthew eight twenty, it says, And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. A living righteous does not guarantee material wealth. Jesus is the most righteous person that ever lived. He didn't even have a place to lay his head. The prosperity gospel you hear today is false doctrine for this age. When men say that it, you're going to prosper if you give or prosper if you live right, that's not necessarily true. And in verses 23 through 27, Jesus Christ is asleep in a ship. In the flesh, he got tired. And he experienced what it was like to be a man and get sleepy. 
but they woke him up and he calmed the storm. What if he was like some people and they couldn't get him up for nothing? I mean, if there's somebody asleep, some people, they don't want to wake up. You can yell at them. You can throw stuff at them. You can put shaving cream on their hand and then tickle their face with a feather and they still don't wake up. What if Jesus said, wake me up in five more minutes? Nope, he, he, he got up and he, he calmed the storm. At the end of chapter 8, he runs into a, a, a couple of devil-possessed men that were so fierce you couldn't even get around them. So they would scare the average man, but not Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ scared them. They said, are you, are you come to torment us before the time? So unclean spirits, they know their future is a lake of fire. They know their future has torment. In chapter 9, you have signs that accompany the kingdom because the Jews require a sign. Jesus Christ heals a man sick of the palsy who's lying on a bed, but before he does this, he forgives his sins. Showing that taking care of yourself, spiritually speaking, is better than taking care of yourself, physically speaking. In Matthew 9, 12 through 13, it says, But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. But I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Notice how the Lord tells them to go and learn what that meaneth. There should never be a time when you're not trying to learn something about the things of God. You're always forgetting something. You have to refresh yourself on what you learn and continue to learn new things or you'll only get dumber. If you're not learning anything, you're presently getting dumber because you're constantly forgetting something. So you have to replace what you're forgetting with stuff that you're learning. But the Pharisees thought that they knew it all. They, they thought they had already figured everything out. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 8, 2, If any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. In Galatians 6, 3, it says, For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. The more you learn about the Bible, the more you end up finding out that you know very little about the Bible or about anything. In chapter 9, you also have the story of the woman who was healed just by touching the Lord's garment. In Matthew 9, 21, it says, For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. What if you could put on this garment? Imagine how that would heal you. Uh, Paul sending a handkerchief could heal people. But what if the Lord gave you the shirt off his back? He actually did. The Roman soldiers cast lots for his garment. He lost his clothes so that you could put on a robe of righteousness. In Isaiah 61, 10, it says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels, Jesus Christ gave you the shirt off his back. You can put on a righteous robe, and you're going to be perfectly healed. You're going to get a glorified body one day. In Revelation 19, 8, it says, Unto her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. We're going to get a change of clothes one day. When the devil-possessed maniac got right with God, it says he was clothed and in his right mind. You just need to touch the hem of the Lord's garment. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then one day you're going to get that glorified body. You're going to be clothed with your house from heaven. You're not going to have to worry about sin anymore. Jesus also restores a young girl to life in chapter 9. They thought that he was crazy and laughed at him. They forgot that nothing was too hard for God. Jesus heals two blind men and they go to spread it about the country. He was becoming more and more famous with each miracle he was performing. In Matthew 9, 32, it says, And they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with the devil. 
Jesus not only can help you see, but he can help you speak. When you first got saved, your mind was blinded for so long by the devil. The Lord Jesus Christ opened your eyes. When you first got saved, Jesus began to teach you how to talk. You most likely got rid of your cussing. You hopefully got bold in your speech for the Lord. In Matthew 9, 33 through 34, it says, And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake, and the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never so seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said he casted out devils through the prince of the devils. The devil-possessed man was healed, and the extremely devil-possessed religious crowd got upset about it. When Jesus Christ saves you, the religious people are going to get angry about it. In chapter 10, you see the Lord's 12 disciples, and he's giving them power. And the names of the 12 disciples is Simon Peter, Andrew, the brother of Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, John, the son of Zebedee, Philip, Barth Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the publican, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot. These men walked and talked with Jesus Christ. They sat under the his preaching and teaching. In Matthew ten fourteen through 15, it says, And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. It would be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in judgment than it would be for America. We have had way more light and way more preaching and if Sodom would have had what we had, what we have had, they would have repented. All the great preachers. What if they had all those great preachers that you've heard? Also in chapter 10, the Lord is going to give the disciples a glimpse of the tribulation time period. In Matthew 10, 16 and 17, it says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they shall scourge you in their synagogues. Paul says, All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you haven't yet, then you're probably going too soon if you're living for God. Stay right with God now so that when persecution comes, you'll be able to stand. Jesus encouraged the disciples to not fear men. He says in Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Why fear a man that can only kill the body? He can't touch your soul. Matthew 10, 34, Think not that I am come to send peace to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. When you get Jesus Christ in the Bible, it may divide you and your family. It might divide you and your friends. It might make your spouse not like you anymore. God and the Bible have standards. There is doctrine in the Bible, and that also divides people. This is why preachers won't touch doctrine much. When someone really finds out what you believe about something or about a certain thing, they don't like you anymore. The Bible divides. Jesus Christ said, I came not to send peace, but a sword. In Matthew 11, John is imprisoned. Also, you see where John the Baptist has some of his disciples come and ask Jesus if he is really the Christ or not. And this doesn't change the Lord's opinion of John at all. In Matthew eleven eleven, it says, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. There is a comfort to me right here because when I mess up, it doesn't change the Lord's opinion about me. John sent some disciples of his to Jesus to ask if he was really the Christ or not. And you'll see there in Matthew eleven eleven that that didn't change the Lord's opinion about John at all. In Luke seven twenty eight it says, For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not risen a greater than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And I entered the kingdom of God when I got saved. I might be least in the kingdom of God, but Jesus calls us greater than John the Baptist. And when we mess up, uh, he still sees us as great. 
When the Lord looks at me, he doesn't see my righteousness. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that is why we are greater. Nothing can change it. Matthew eleven twelve, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. This great verse proves that the kingdom of heaven is a physical kingdom because it can be taken by force. It is different from the spiritual kingdom of God. It, it, that's a spiritual kingdom. Now, they're sometimes used interchangeab interchangeably because when Jesus Christ is on earth, both kingdoms are present. And today, in this age, we are not setting up a physical kingdom of heaven. We are giving the gospel to others in hopes that they will believe and enter the spiritual kingdom of God. Matthew eleven thirteen says, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. This excellent verse shows you that there are divisions in Scripture. And if a person doesn't want to refer to themselves as a dispensationalist, then okay, that's fine but they can still get great help in approaching the Bible by seeing these very clear divisions in Scripture. For example, here in Matthew eleven thirteen, 13, it says, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. That shows a clear division. In John 1, 17, it says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So just with those two verses that we just mentioned, it gives you these clear divisions. For example, Adam to Moses, a time before the law. You have Adam to Moses, a time before the law. But John 1.17 said, For the law was given by Moses, and grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So you have Adam to Moses, which would be a time before the law. You have the time of Moses, a time during the law. Then you have John the Baptist, the time during the Lord's earthly ministry, because it said, for all the law, for the all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. So you have Adam to Moses, a time before the law, a time of Moses during the law, and then John the Baptist, because the law and the prophets prophesied until John. And then you have after the death, burial, and resurrection, which would be called the New Testament. Hebrews 9.16 says, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. So the New Testament didn't begin until the death of Jesus Christ. Also notice that people didn't start getting into the body of Christ until after he gave himself for our sins. In Ephesians 2.16 it says, And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. There are just basic and clear divisions in Scripture that I just showed you. In Matthew 11.14 Jesus said, And if you will to receive it, this is Elias which was for to come. The Lord said this while referring to John the Baptist. If the Jews would have received Jesus Christ, then John would have been fulfilling the prophecy about Elijah. In Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 through 6, it says, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. However, you know the story. The Jews rejected Jesus as their Messiah. Now the prophecy of Elijah returning will be in the time of Jacob's trouble. If they would have accepted Jesus, John the Baptist would have been Elijah. You see, God has things set up to where no matter what decision someone makes, the scriptures still get fulfilled. If the Jews would have accepted Jesus Christ as their Messiah, the Lord wouldn't have turned to the Gentiles. But since they did, he's turned to the Gentiles. In Romans 11, 11, it says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. God turned to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. Had they accepted Jesus, the church age wouldn't have even came about. In Matthew 11, Jesus Christ also rebukes some of the unrepentant cities. 
Imagine what he would say to San Francisco, New York City, or even your hometown if he was here today. Can you imagine what he would say? He said in Matthew eleven twenty two, 22, But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou Capernaum, which art exalted into heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it should be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. It would be more tolerable for Sodom than for America. Because America is beyond wicked after all the light that we've had in this country. With the amount of blessings and light and preaching and teaching and moving of God that America has seen, there shouldn't be such a God-hating mess going on. In Matthew, Matthew 12, you have the king rejected. You see the sin of blasphemy. Jesus is accused by the Pharisees, but he shows us that he is Lord over the Sabbath. He even heals a man with a withered hand. This is the same chapter that Jesus is accused of casting out devils by the power of the devil. This is the same chapter that Jesus Christ prophesies about himself being in the heart of the earth, where he says in Matthew twelve forty, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And in Jonah, it called it a great fish, but Jesus confirms that it's a well. Jesus also preaches about when an unclean spirit returns to inhabit a person. In Matthew twelve forty three through 45, it says, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then, saith he, then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Now this could represent a religious person who is simply turning over a new leaf but never actually gets saved. They get religion. The unclean spirits may leave as that person tries to clean up their life. So... They're empty, swept, and garnished. But when the unclean spirits return, they come with their other unclean spirit buddies, and they make the person worse than they were the first time. This is why religious people can be the most devil-possessed people alive. The people who gave me the hardest time haven't been your average lost redneck or thug. The people who have given me the hardest time were lost religious people who are full of the devil. They're empty, swept, and garnished. They have turned over a new leaf. They're trying to live right to because they think they're saved by works. But it just makes them mean. It just makes them judge you and think that they're better than you. In chapters 13 through 23, the Lord speaks in parables because of Israel's rejection. In Matthew 13, you have the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. You're going to see Jesus preach the parable of the sower, the weeds, the mustard seed, and leaven. The parable of the pearl of great price, the net. He is also going to show you the purpose of the parables. And here is the purpose in Matthew thirteen fifteen: For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. In chapter 14, you'll see the death of John the Baptist, and Harold thinks that John the Baptist had rose from the dead and was doing mighty works through Jesus Christ. You see, Herod had killed John the Baptist. John told him that it wasn't lawful for him to take his brother Philip's wife. So Herod had had him put in prison, and Herod's wife sneakily worked things out for John to have his head chopped off because she hated the preacher so much and what he stood for. And in this chapter... You'll see the feeding of the 5,000, one of Jesus' most well-known miracles. You'll see Jesus walking on the water, possibly his most well-known miracle. In chapter 15, the Lord rebukes people for their tradition and then feeds the 4,000. So he's keeping people well-fed. If you want to be like Jesus, keep them well-fed. In Matthew 15, 9, it says, But in vain 
they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Tradition is a bad thing unless it is a Bible-based tradition. The Pharisees were more concerned with washing their hands and the things that were going in their mouth. They weren't very much concerned with what was coming out of their nasty mouth. In Matthew 15, 10 through 11, it says, And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. It's worse to sit around and cuss and tell dirty jokes and gossip and slander with clean hands than to sit down with a clean mouth and eat with your dirty hands. One time at work, I sat down to eat me a sandwich real quick. My hands were black from working, and they were cut up, and they were nasty looking. And the guys were like, aren't you going to wash your hands, you, you blankety blank? I mean, they were just joking. They're just rough. But I thought to myself, thank you for the illustration. I couldn't ask for a better illustration. It goes right along with this. They were more concerned about the washing of the hands and what was going to go in their mouth than their filthy mouth and what was coming out of their mouth. I couldn't ask for a better illustration. In Matthew fifteen seventeen through 20, it says, Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the drop. But those things which proceed out of the mouth came forth from the heart, and they defile the man, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. And you're going to see Jesus healing people and performing the great miracle of feeding the 4,000, as I said. A greater miracle is that Jesus has enough Bible to go around to feed every member of the church for their entire Christian life without it ever getting boring. The same way that Jesus seemed to be able to make food to just never run out. He's gave us 66 books of the Bible. Your entire Christian life, you're never going to run out of something to read. You're never going to run out of something to study. You can look at each verse of Scripture and peel it off like a piece of bread and it just grows right back. Then you peel it off again and you can approach it a different way and it just grows right back. If pastors realized that there are 1,189 chapters, they could preach a chapter of service and that would last them 1,189 services. That would last them at least eight years and if they did three services a week it's going to last them about that much time and that is if you don't ever split up any of the chapters and then you can go back and look at each application you'll just keep going and going and going you never run out of something to preach there are limitless topics you can do a an overview of each book you can study a certain word throughout the bible also you can examine deeply a certain character in the bible you're not going to run out of things to preach and teach if you'll stay in the book. The Lord has given you an everlasting supply of food that's never going to run out. In chapter 16, the Jews require a sign. And the Lord teaches the disciples to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Peter shines when he confesses that Jesus is the Christ. And then a few verses later, he gets rebuked by Jesus for saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, concerning his death, burial, and resurrection. So Jesus said, Get thee behind me, Satan. One time as a kid, I had a youth leader, and she said if she was there at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, she would have pulled him off of the cross because she loves him so much. And I mean, I can understand she's got a sincere heart, but Jesus would have said the same thing to her as he said to Peter. He would have said, get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus had to die on the cross to fulfill the scripture. You can't stop the scripture from being fulfilled, even if you're sincere. You're sincerely wrong. In chapter 17, Moses and Elijah meet up with Jesus Christ, and that is why it isn't far-fetched for them to show up again later in Revelation chapter 11. They already did it once. Why not again? Then the Lord heal heals a boy that was possessed with the devil, and the devil had been causing him to get in the water and in the fire. Devils lead you to suicide. In chapter 18, the devil's or the disciples come to Jesus Christ and ask him, Who is the greatest? 
That is what man is still concerned with today. Who is the greatest of all time? They call it the GOAT. They're concerned with who is the rap god. Some say it's Eminem. Some say Jay-Z and Nas or Biggie or some other devil-possessed maniac. Some ask who is the greatest quarterback. Some say Tom Brady or Peyton Manning or Joe Montana or some other person that will grow old one day. The fact is that Jesus Christ is the greatest. He'll always be the greatest. He'll never grow old. He'll never lose his skill set. Who is the greatest? The Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 19, the Pharisees ask the Lord about divorce and remarriage. And we know this is an insincere question coming from them because it says they came unto him tempting him. They were always trying to catch him in his words. In chapter 20, Jesus Christ explains how it is better to serve than to be worried about ruling over people. Learn to serve people. Matthew 20, 28, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He came to serve. In Philippians 2, 7, it says, He took upon the form of a serpent. 1 Timothy 2, 6 says, He gave himself a ransom for all. Matthew 20, 33 through 34 says, They say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Remember when you had your eyes blinded, and you had your eyes open to the truth of the gospel, and then after that you had your eyes open to the sinfulness of this world? In Matthew 21, you see the triumphal entry. He fulfilled the scripture of Zechariah 9 and verse 9. In chapter 21, Jesus Christ also cleanses the temple. He overthrows the tables of the money changers. And he says that they made his house a den of thieves. Today our body is the temple. And Jesus is on the inside and you need to let him overthrow some things in there. Let him overthrow some tables and get rid of anything that's defiling. In 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17, it says, Know ye not that, you're, that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Jesus could come in there. Jesus lives in you if you're saved. You need to let him go in there and overthrow some tables. Let him get rid of the junk in you. Anything that may be defiling his temple. You don't want to make his house a den of thieves. Jesus confirms that the religious Pharisee crowd are more dark and wicked on the inside than your average harlot. In Matthew 21, 32, it says, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not, but the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. But the publicans and the harlots believed Jesus Christ shows the Pharisees their wickedness in the parable of the tenants, and they seek to kill him. In Matthew 21, 45 through 46, it says, And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them, but when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude, because they took him for a prophet. If Jesus was here today, they would crucify him again. They hated him then, and they hate him now. And that is why he said, Marvel not if the world hates you. In uh, chapter 22, you have the parable of the wedding feast. Also, the Pharisees asked Jesus about paying taxes to Caesar. And in verse 15, he said, Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And you see, well, once again, they're trying to get the Lord to say something out of the way. But Jesus Christ is the living word, and you're not going to get his, his tongue tangled up. If you're, not, if you're not going to get entangled in your words by the opposition, if you're going to be able to be like Jesus and not get tangled in your words, you need to study to show thyself approved unto God. In 1 Peter 3.15 it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Always be ready. In Matthew twenty two eighteen, he calls them a hypocrite to their face. Jesus Christ came to save sinners, but he was a rough character with the unrepentant religious crowd. The Pharisees go on to ask more questions that would have been hard for the average man to answer. However, not for the God-man. They said if a woman has seven husbands, 
when she's alive and then after she dies which one will be her husband in the resurrection the lord is quick to tell them like it is again and he says in matthew twenty two twenty nine, jesus answered and said unto them you do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of god he told those men that were supposed to be mighty in the law that they didn't even know the scriptures the Lord gives them their answer, and he says in verse 30, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Schofield uses this verse to teach that angels are sexless. However, it, it doesn't say that. It says the angels that are in heaven don't marry. It didn't say they were sexless. Also, there are angels that left their first estate that did marry. In Genesis 6, when angels show up in the Bible, they are always male. In these great verses in chapter 22, 37 through 40, Jesus gives some great instruction. And if you'll do these things, you'll never have to worry if you're living right or not. Look at these great instructions from the greatest preacher that ever lived, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew 22, 37 through 40, he said, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. If you love God and love people, then you aren't going to break the commandments of God. Breaking the commandments of God always hurt God and other people. If you love God, you keep his commandments. 1 John 5, 3, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. If you are good to your neighbor and treat him like you want to be treated, you aren't going to have any trouble with what God wants you to do. Romans thirteen eight through 10, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So, if you love your neighbor, if you really love him, and you're treating him like you love him, you're not going to commit adultery with his wife. You're not going to go up to him and kill him. You're not going to steal from him. You're not going to lie to him. You're not going to covet what he has. I mean, if you love your neighbor like you should and love God like you should, that's going to help you keep the commandments. I mean, think about it. The commandments aren't bad. Everybody acts like, oh, man, I, I hate keeping these commandments. I mean, the commandments in the Bible, it's God's just wanting you to treat people right. He's wanting you to treat him right. In chapter three, twenty-three, you have one of the rough, roughest sermons ever preached and it's in front of the people that need it the most. Jesus Christ preaches a sermon rebuking the Pharisees right to their face. I don't think he even had an outline. He just let it rip. This was tougher than anything by Phil Kidd or Danny Castle ever had. The toughest preachers you know, they, they don't even preach as hard as Jesus preached in this sermon. This is tougher than anything J. Frank Norris ever had. This is rougher speech than Ruckman ever had. You know, everybody always hates Ruckman's hard and rough speech. But what Jesus said was a lot rougher than anything Ruckman ever said. In chapter 24, you have the definitive chapter on the tribulation period where Jesus Christ sits on the Mount of Olives, the same place where he will be at the second coming. And his disciples ask him about the end of the world, and he lays it on them really clear. You could call the first half of the tribulation, the beginning of sorrows, and the last half, the great tribulation. But he lays it all out up to the second coming of himself. So Jesus Christ preaches salvation. He preaches forgiveness. He preaches on hell. He reproved. He rebuked. And now in Matthew 24, he's giving you some prophecy. He gives the people a good, balanced diet. He's the most well-rounded preacher that you ever saw. And if you want to be like preacher like jesus preach on everything like he did in chapter 25 you have the 10 virgins five are wise and five are foolish the foolish ones went out with their lamps and took no oil with them 
the wise ones took oil in their vessels. And then when the bridegroom came, the wise ones went in, the door shut behind them, and the foolish couldn't get in. And this has absolutely nothing to do with us, the church. The church is a chaste virgin, according to 2 Corinthians 11, 2. And in Matthew 25, these are virgins, plural. Just like in Revelation, it mentions virgins in regards to the saints during that time. Notice how precise the Bible is, letting you know. Therefore, chapter 25 doctrinally has nothing to do with you losing your salvation or anything like that. In chapter 26, you have the anointing of the king. This is where you will also find the Last Supper. You'll see Jesus uh, praying in Gethsemane. And this is also where he is betrayed and arrested. He's betrayed by his own friend, Judas Iscariot, the traitor. And in chapter 27, you have Peter's denial. You have the trial and the crucifixion. In chapter 28, you have the resurrection and the Great Commission. But that is it for Matthew and next we'll do Mark.